Hi, and welcome to Geiranger, the pearl of Norwegian fjords. This is how the majority of people experience Geiranger, from the comfort of their own car, perhaps not as comfortable as this one, or more commonly from the viewing deck of a cruise ship. One thing is to come here to behold the drama that nature has staged for us. Quite another thing is to live here. You see that farm up there? It looks kind of cool, doesn't it? But imagine living there. The very same features that make Eranger so beautiful is also what made life here so hard. And in today's program, we'll celebrate the life on the fjord and in the small farms up in the hillsides. I'll start off in the most remote of places where I'll fish some mountain trout and I'll smoke it and serve it with a nettle soup. I'm going to make a traditional long simmered stew called in a literal translation burn your snout. I'm also going to make a beef tartare using raw meat, celery axe, local wild herbs and sweet mustard. Geiranger is a kind of unique place. In order to be able to live here, you would have to be quite fit. You would have to be able to cope with a certain degree of loneliness. And you should at least really appreciate nature and the wonderful view. In 2006, Geiranger was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And the farm here at Skagerfloor is now being lovingly restored back to its original form, giving people a glimpse of what life here could be like. There you can see the fish. I've been told that there is a technique to catching a fish, and that is to tickle it on its belly. Oh! oh. Huh. So it does work. All you need is to tickle it. Ah, no. Oh, I think point proven. It is a method that works, but I think I'll stick with more conventional methods. Oh, this is not a baby fish. They don't get any bigger than this, but they are delicious, so they don't get any better either. And when I was a kid, I was fishing in a river much like this. And after we'd finished, we would uh, pick a birch twig and we'd attach the fish to it. And I've continued the tradition. Of course, when you were living at Skagerfloor, you wouldn't visit your neighbor very often. Hello!
And when you when fishing, you try to conserve them for as long a period as possible. And one of the best ways to conserve fish is by salting and smoking them. Here I have some special rosemary salt. Um, the good thing about rosemary is that it contains some antioxidants and it helps prevent bacterial activity, which is very important, especially if you are going to uh, smoke the fish for a very long time, which I'm not going to today. Well, this much is very conventional cooking, isn't it? Just rubbing a fish with salt. So now comes the unconventional part. You remember your mother always told you, never let the pot boil dry. And why was that? Because then the room would be filled with smoke and it might start to burn. Well, that's what we're going to utilize today. Here I have a very empty pot of a relatively high heat, some wood shavings. This is oak. You can also use hickory or apple wood. Distributing it more or less evenly, leaving one small patch where the fish is going to be. I'm putting the fish here, still using the birch twig. Putting on the lid and waiting for what my mother warned me would happen. So now you can see that it's starting to smoke ferociously. What you can't see is that it's also getting quite hot. The fish is going to be hot smoked. It's going to be cooked and then have an added smoky flavor to it. When it comes to time, it's very difficult to say how exactly how long it should smoke. But I would say, as a general rule, something in the neighborhood of 20 minutes. Turn off the heat, leave it for another five minutes, and then the fish should be done. <coughs> it can be quite hard to, to stay in the smoke like this. But now I'm leaving for a much more unpleasant task. Ouch. Oh. One useful thing when picking nettles is just some rubber gloves. Time to have a look at the, the fish. Oh, look at it. You can see the fish is nicely yellow from the smoke. I'm turning off the heat and just putting the lid on so that they'll smoke a little bit more from this trickle of smoke coming up from the shavings. For I return to the nasty nettles. So you can't eat this stuff. So I'm removing everything but the leaves. I like to make a combination of nettles and spinach in the same pot. So here I have some nicely cleaned baby spinach, just adding that to the same pot. Adding a little bit of cream, about two deciliters, a little less than a cup. Leaving them to boil in the cream for about 10 minutes. Ah, see the difference here? Now it's a fine mess down here. This I'm going to puree into a kind of more or less soup-like consistency. This doesn't look so fierce anymore, but of course there's no salt in this. So I'm adding a bit of that same rosemary salt. And then a kind of common thing that I really like is a combination of nutmeg and spinach. And it works wonders with nettles as well. So just shaving a little bit of nutmeg over. And then some of the fish. Look at these. They look fabulous. And it comes off the bone very nicely, which is a good indication that it is cooked through. And a little bit of yogurt for some of that fresh slightly sour taste. Normally, this is how I would serve it, were it not for the fact that I see that the elm tree over here is in that face where it has these, come here, 
when I was a child, we used to call these money. We, we used to play around and think that this is money and we would use them in our games. But they also, they're edible. To be honest, they don't taste that much. They have this kind of nice salady flavor with a little bit of nuttiness to them. So I'm using that just as a garnish. So if you have an elm tree in your garden, use them. If not, no sweat. If you don't bother to smoke your own trout, you could use smoked salmon instead. That salty and smoky flavor is really nice with the, the green healthy flavors from the spinach and nettles. Even if you were living in the community center of Geiranger, life could be fairly isolated. Geiranger didn't have an all-weather road until 1954. Before that, you only had a few miles, a few kilometers of road. And if you wanted to go somewhere in the middle of winter, you'd have to wait for the ferry to take you to the nearby town. And they could only do so if there was no ice on the fjord. Still, Geiranger has always had a thing for cars. From the classic cars collected by the owners of the historical Union Hotel to the many visitors who come here every summer with their vintage automobiles. During winter, there's real action on these roads. Long after the last tourist has left, the hotel is reopened to accommodate the test drivers from one of the major German car producers. They test their newest models on the slippery and winding roads. If they can make it here, they can pretty much make it anywhere. I love beef. Uh, and the beef that I love the most is that flavorful meat from these mountain cows. You can actually see it here. The, the meat is really dark and it has this gamey flavor as well. What I'm going to do now is make my version of a traditional local stew that's called Brennsnut, which in a literal translation means burn your snout. It is one of those hot, hardy soups where you're trying to get as much flavor out of the meat as possible. That's why you're using these cheap cuts. And I'm starting off with the most flavorful part. It's tough, there's not much meat around, but it is incredibly flavorful. I'm chopping it up. <laughs> it's starting to look like a mess, doesn't it? Well, the thing is, the finer you chop it, the more flavor you get out of it. And I'm not just going to boil the meat, I'm going to sear it first. That releases a, a lot of those kind of browning, caramelizing flavors. So I'm just using a little bit of olive oil. I'm going to remove the oxtail afterwards. Uh, I'm not using the meat, I'm only using it to get a uh, stock that is as concentrated as possible. And here I have another cheap cut of meat that is also very, very flavorful. You can use basically anything. You can use the meat from the breast area. You can use any kind of cutaways from, from the leg. You can use the shank. This is meat that if you were to treat it like a normal steak, you'd have the toughest they ever you'd sit and chew all evening but if you simmer it for a long long time it's the most tender thing you can imagine 
and we're going to afford ourselves a little bit of luxury by adding a, a little bit of normal lean meat that you could actually eat without simmering it for hours. And again, exactly what cut of meat is not so important. Now I'm turning the heat up to full blast and searing the meat all over. You can see the oxtail is nicely browned now. Uh, it is starting to give away some of its moisture and is actually uh, boiling in its own juices. So there's no point in this process anymore. So I'm going to add boiling water. I'm adding enough water to cover the meat. And what happens now is a very interesting process. Now you see that it's starting to get cloudy here on the surface. And these impurities are just egg white like proteins and fats that are rising to the surface. And one of the points now to get a really good stock is to remove them. So I'm skimming them off just like this. As you can see, this is not very efficient. I have another method. I'll just have to wait until the water starts really boiling. So the question is how to remove all this gooey stuff that's going to create impurities in the stock and also some bitter flavors. Well, the answer is really very simple. Eggs, or to be more precise, egg whites. This gooey stuff has much the same content as egg whites. So if I add egg whites here, they're going to attract most of the impurities. When I remove this, I'm going to remove most of what I want away. This is not for eating, this is for throwing away to the wolves. And as you can see, it's much, much better now. So I'm going to let this simmer, but adding a few black peppercorns, a couple of bay leaves, thank you, placing on the lid, and I'll let it simmer for a couple of hours. Now the soup has simmered and it's time to remove the oxtail. Of course, at this stage, it doesn't contain any salt, so it's difficult to taste it, but it has this huge full-bodied beef taste. But the most important thing here is, of course, the stock and the vegetables. Among them, cabbage that I'll shred finely. Cabbage is, of course, very dominant, but it's not going to be the only vegetable here. The rutabaga, or swede, as it's sometimes also referred to. And throughout my years of cooking, I have specialized a special technique of uneven chopping. As you see, very effortless, I managed to make some of the chunks very big and some very small. It does take a lot of practice, but try this at home. Now, if this is comfort food for the traditionalists, then the next is food for those a bit more adventurous, perhaps even a bit barbaric. That's at least why steak tartare got its name. It's named after the Tartars of the Caucasus, who were believed to be so barbaric that they would sometimes eat their meat raw, which of course today is relatively natural. But it is very important when it comes to eating raw meat that you buy the meat from a good source, a reliable source that you trust, that you treat the meat with utmost care, and that you chop the meat yourself. The thing is that there's only bacterial activity on the surface, so when the meat is whole like this, it's relatively safe. But once you chop it or mince it, the surface area is multiplied by hundreds or even thousands. That means that if there's bacterial activity it can possibly be dangerous. So you would want it to stay chopped for as sh a short a period of time as possible. Quite a lot of recipes call for filet when making 
steak tartare, I actually think it's much better using sirloin like this because sirloin has more flavor. And since you're chopping it to very small pieces, uh, the aspect of tenderness is not so important. A classic steak tartare, the French way, has pickles and capers and an egg yolk. I'm going to make a slightly different version using some of the same ingredients as I actually used in the Bernier snout. Some celery ac, uh, returning to that sweetness, grating the celery ac finely. A couple of tablespoons or so. And then celery. Kind of same, much of the same flavors, but, but much, much fresher tasting from the celery. So combination of the two is very nice. Small crunchy pieces of celery. You won't know they're there until you bite into one. A little bit of pepper for temperament, about a teaspoon or so. And then I always think it's nice with just a, a little bit of coriander seed as well for some additional sweetness. And I'm just crushing it very coarsely. Like this. And we need some herbs, some local herbs. There are many more edible things out in nature than we tend to think about. This looks modest, but this is really wild sorrel. And it has a kind of pleasantly sour taste. But if you can't find wild sorrel, you can use store-bought sorrel. You can also use a kind of peppery salad type, like rocket salad, arugula salad. Normally you can pick wild marjoram or oregano around here, but it's too early in the year. When the snow has melted on the mountain peaks, that's when the oregano starts to pop up. Oregano is, by the way, called mountain mint around here. But this is just normal store-bought oregano. The flavor isn't quite as intense, but the kind of taste profile of it is more or less the same. And an interesting thing about oregano and also rosemary is that they're often used together with meat in meat dishes, and particularly when meat is being preserved. And that's not only because they lend a really nice flavor to the meat, but also because they contain high levels of antioxidants, which actually slow down the bacterial activities on the meat. So it's very useful as well. And then I'm going to also flavor the meat with some sweet mustard. You can also use a combination of Dijon mustard and a little bit of honey. Salt, just a little bit, and then mixing this together. Mixing it well and dividing it into two more or less equal parts. Oh, it looks wonderful, doesn't it? And then, of course, the egg. In Norway, we don't have much of a problem with salmonella, but if you're not 100% sure about this one, use pasteurized eggs. And here I'm only using the egg yolk. And this is food that is for those who like to live dangerously, not because it's dangerous in itself, but because of our dining area. Oh. 